David. First Corinthians, please, if you will. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15. We're going to try to get through this before Brother Sam Wilson gets here. Chapter 15. I may have to look at a little bit Wednesday night as well. Um, we talked about proofs of the resurrection, salvation, scripture, and he was seen. The importance of the resurrection. We found out this morning without it, there is no hope. Now let's look at the order of the resurrection. The order of the resurrection. The Bible said in verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also resurrection of the dead. The res by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ, that is coming, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Let me stop reading right there. We'll try to go a little further tonight, but I'm going to stop reading right there for the time being. Now, we're looking at the order of the resurrection. If you'll notice the first words right there in verse number 20, but now. Verse number 20, 21, and 22, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of course, assures us and guarantees the future resurrection of all men. That's no question about that. All will be raised, both saved and unsaved. We talked about this morning, Adam, the federal head, and we went to, of the human race, brought death, physical as well as spiritual, death upon all men. We looked at Romans chapter number five and spent a little time in closing on that this morning. Well, verse number 21, Jesus Christ, the second man, the last Adam, and if you'll notice, and uh, we, we showed you that this morning, but look in verse 45 of chapter 15. The Bible said, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. He's called the last Adam in verse number 45, and in verse number 47, he is the second man from heaven. The first man is of the earth, the earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So he's called the, the, uh, the uh, of course, in verse number 45, the last Adam and the second man. Uh, now, Jesus Christ made possible the physical resurrection of all Adam's offspring, both saved and lost. And because in verse number 22 of 1 Corinthians 15, because of Christ's resurrection, all men will be bodily raised. For sure, for sure. The destiny will be different, but saved and lost will be resurrected bodily to exist forever. Body and soul, uh, either heaven or hell. Man was created to live forever. And the fact that sin came does not put an end to God's purpose. Man was created to live forever. There's some religions out here that teach people go to the grave and die like a dog, and that's it. So if that's true, just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. No, no. We, we get some things in order on this side of the grave, and we read and study till we come to that saving knowledge of Christ. We trust Him, and that is eternal life. The moment He enters in you, he, eternal life enters in you. The fact that sin came does not put an end to God's purpose. Now, there's a difference between eternal life and existing forever. There's a difference between eternal life and existing forever. The Bible says over here, in the, and I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians, but the Bible does say in the book of uh, 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number 20, and we know that the Son of God is come and hath given, to, uh, given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. And the Bible said this is, Jesus Christ is, this is the true God and eternal life. Eternal life is the life of God imparted to the believer. Now, the divine life of God imparted to you is beyond an endless existence. Endless existence, eternal separation from God. I don't know if I thought of it. I can't really. I want to give credit to the man that said this because it... Uh, 
but I'm not sure if I, I read it somewhere or, or just recalled it to memory. But he was telling the difference between, uh, I was reading, I had to be reading it somewhere. I couldn't come up with something this good. Uh, he was telling the difference between eternal life and, and uh, uh, living forever, living forever. Uh, divine life of God imparted to you is beyond, it's beyond endless existence and which is eternal separation from God, but it is a beginningless existence never to leave his person. And I had to wrap my mind around that. It's a beginningless existence never to leave his person. Then I read 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number 20. He is eternal life. And he's also called eternal life in 1 John chapter number 3 when it says eternal life abiding in him. In him. 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 15. Speaking of a different situation, but Jesus is still eternal life abiding in him. In him. So I had to wrap my mind around that and I, I finally got a hold of it. When he entered in, it was a, he gave me himself eternal life. He, he entered in me. He entered in me, which is a beginningless existence, never, ever, ever to leave his person, never to leave his, never to leave his side. Now, the difference between eternal life and everlasting existence, and I don't want you to turn there because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go pretty quickly, but I'm going to give you some verses. I'm going to read them to you, and uh, you can write them down if you like. The difference between eternal life and everlasting existence. The Bible gives us some verses in Matthew chapter number 25 and verse number 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And then John chapter 3 verse number 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John chapter number 6 verse 54, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. In John chapter number 17, verse number three, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Then we look at, that's eternal life. Then we look at everlasting existence. Mark chapter number nine, verse number 48, talks about those that are in hell in the lake of fire. The Bible said their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The Bible also says in Revelation chapter number 19 and verse number 11, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. So there's a difference between eternal life and eternal existence. Eternal life is Christ. Eternal life is Christ in you, a beginningless existence. A beginningless existence. I finally got a hold of that. Amen. And that life is going to be in a body which will be raised from the grave. Amen. Life is going to be in a body which will be raised from the grave. Now, there's two places I want you to look at. There's, first of all, is in Daniel, then in John chapter 5. Uh, in Daniel, I'm still going, it still ties in with 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. But in the book of Daniel, in chapter number 12, the Bible says this in verse number 2. Daniel chapter number 12 in verse number 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Some will be raised to everlasting life, some will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt. And then we uh, said, turn over here to the book of John, John chapter number 5. John chapter 5. These two verses I'm reading you establish the fact that everybody born in the world from Adam to the last man born will be raised. The Bible says in John chapter number five and uh, verse number 20, what is it, verse 28 and 29. Marvel not at this for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They shall come forth. They, uh, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So, we have one eternal life and one, uh, we have divine eternal justice is what it is, everlasting justice for that individual that never trusts Christ. Now, there's four things established right there in John chapter number five and verse number 28 and 29 that we just got through reading. First of all, we know there's going to be a resurrection. No one can read John chapter five, verse 28 and 29 and deny that the Lord spoke of a resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection 
And then not only that, but John 5, 28 and 29 establishes it's going to be a bodily resurrection. A bodily resurrection. Not a spiritual resurrection, but a bodily resurrection. Everyone that's went to the grave is going to be raised. Everyone is going to be raised. Now, it will include all men. We learn that from John chapter number 5, verse 28 and 29. There's a sermon right there just in these two verses. There's going to be a resurrection. It's going to be a bodily resurrection. It will include all men. And it's definite two classes of people. It's going to be raised. We have one, the, in simple, as simple as it can be, it's the saved and the lost. The believers and the unbelievers. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, in verse number 23, the Bible said, But every man in his own order. Every man in his own order. We have to look at the order of the resurrection. And uh, Paul, uh, God gives Paul just what we need to hear in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 to, to uh, uh, actually come to the conclusion that there is an order and it's God's order. And if we look at it and we study it, it's really pretty simple to figure out. It really is. Now, life is going to be in the body. We know that. We know the things that they teach. Now, every man in his own order, separated by time. Now, there's at least three groups mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Uh, in verse number, if you'll notice in verse number 23 and 24, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the, uh, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. So at least three classes of people there in the resurrection. Every man in his own order, separated by time. First of all, we have Christ the first fruits. Christ the first fruits. Now, in verse number 20 and 23, we know uh, that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, died on Passover. He arose three days later as the sheaf of the first fruits. We know that from the book of Leviticus. We know, uh, we know that as well because the Bible said here in 1 Corinthians 15, He is the first fruits. He arose three days later as the sheaf of the first fruits. Now, People's ask me when we say that, say, he's not the first one risen. My dear friend, um, others have been raised, but in their human bodies, only to die again, only to die again. But Jesus Christ, his resurrection is the first of its kind. So uh, how else would he be the first fruits if it wasn't a special resurrection? It was a bodily resurrection, but he, he was buried uh, in a human body, and he rose in a glorified body. So it's the first of its kind. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter number uh, 27, verse number uh, 52 and 53, the Bible makes it very clear that it was a glorified body. Let me show you over here. Matthew chapter 27, if you will. Matthew 27, 52 and 53. Uh, the graves were open. Now, here's another question. People say, what are you going to do with it? Well, I'm going to take you to Leviticus and show you. Jesus Christ, the first fruits. Now, if you'll read Matthew chapter number 27, um, that they came out of the graves after his resurrection, verse, 20, verse 53. Verse 53. If you're not careful, you'll read those things that he came out uh, when Jesus died. But we have to read it in the context, and they didn't come out of the graves till after his resurrection. I went to Huntsville State Prison uh, over in Texas and visited death row. It was the most eerie, scary feeling I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, I went through bars that, that uh, only a few go through. I went through bars, and they slammed, clanked behind me and locked, this, that, and the other. I went all the way on death row back there, the people that were ready to be executed. And uh, I had uh, a family in Tennessee get permission for me to come over there to visit their son. And so I went over there and visited the son and talked to him. And when there was, a, there was another fellow that asked permission because he was going to be executed in just, uh, just about a week or so after I was there. And he got special permission to come and talk to me. He said, can I talk to the pastor that's coming to see Steve? And so I went and I talked to both of them. And I gave him, they gave him some truth, gave him some scripture. But this one fella says, I need to know one thing. Out of everything in the Bible. Now, he, he, had, he assured me that he said, I'm saved and going to heaven. I know that. 
He said, I, what I did was wrong. I know I did wrong. And I know what the, 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 under the Noahic covenant, what it says, a man's life for a man's life. He said, I deserve it. He said, but I know where I'm going. And I believed him. I, I believed him. He was calm. Even, by the way, when they did execute him, um, the, I got word back when they executed him, said he went to the table. They were given the lethal injection. And when they executed him, he just said, he just smiled at them. Usually they have to bind them and everything else. And, and uh, he smiled at them and jumped on the table itself. And he said, well, this is my rocket ship home, is what he said. I don't know how you can be that calm. And, but he gave a good testimony. But this is a question he asked me. Only one question he asked me. I thought he was going to ask me some, 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 uh, you know, something about salvation or something like that. But he said, I've got one problem. He said, who were those people in Matthew chapter number 27 that rose after Christ's resurrection? And I said, of all the places in the Bible, you would want to pick that one. Amen. You would want to pick that. And that's exactly what he picked. Well, let me take you back to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Um, everything Christ did, everything that happened was in line with Old Testament. Everything he did was in line with Old Testament. He did not abolish the law. He fulfilled the law. He did not go against the law. He wrote the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. The problem is with you and me. It's not with the law. So the law is good in that sense. Now look at uh, Leviticus chapter 23. In verse number, let's begin reading here in verse uh, number nine. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, when you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits, a sheaf of the first fruits, that is Christ the resurrection. He is keeping in line with Old Testament. Uh, Scripture, Old Testament typology, where the first fruits is Christ. The sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when you have the sheaf as a he lamb, and he, a sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths deal of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine and the fourth part of the hen, and you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the self same day that you have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in your dwelling. And your dwelling. Everything in keeping with Old Testament truth. Jesus Christ, the sheaf, the first fruits were waved, signifying a greater harvest was coming. It was followed by more. These that rose out of their grave in Matthew 27, I didn't read it, but it says in verse 51 of Matthew 27, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly saying, truly this was the son of God. So uh, after the resurrection, they came out. That was part of that first fruits and the sheave of the wave offering. And so that's what they represented right there. Amen. I hope that helped you on that one. All right. So again, three groups of people separated by time. First of all is Christ the first fruits. Afterward, verse 23, they that are Christ and his coming. Now, the, the order is a military term and it means a company or rank. Uh, the resurrection occurs in separate companies, first fruits, and then take your Bibles and go to the book of First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter 4, let's begin reading in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Those that sleep in Jesus, you know that the New Testament, every time it talks about a New Testament saint dying, he's sleeping. He's sleeping. Isn't that gentle? Isn't that gentle? He's sleeping. Uh, even those which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In Jesus will God bring with him. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord, verse 16, himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Um, I submit to you that uh, Jesus Christ, he, we meet him in the clouds. When the Bible says in Philippians 2 that every eye will see him, that is the second coming of Christ on a white horse. I don't know how, the, I really don't know after studying the Bible as much as you have, how anyone could think that this could be a general term, a general resurrection. Jesus meets in the air, they go back, they stand at the Bema seat of Christ. There's seven years, seven years uh, from this point till he comes back on the white horse. And then what happens? Well, the Bible, now going right along with 1 first, with, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 4, that's when the church is caught up and it's only those in Christ. Now I've had some people differ with me on that and that's all right if you do. But only those in the church age are going to be raptured. Those in the church age, those in Christ that were placed in Christ in the church, only the church will be raised, will be raised. Only the saints in Christ will be raised. At, then seven years at the Bema seat, uh, as we stand before the Bema seat to be judged whether our works uh, were burned or whether they will withstand the fire. Now, going right along with that same time period is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Um, even your, at the last trump, now when you read Revelation, you have, your, you have your seal judgments, then you have your trump judgments, then you have your vile or bold judgments, vile judgments, V-I-A-L, judgments. Um, so there's a lot of people because of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 say, well, the last trump, does not happen, but right before the, the Antichrist is revealed. So that has to be the last trump when people are raised. I, I submit to you it's not. It does not even match the same time in the book of Revelation. It doesn't. So when, when you say, how are you going to explain the last trump? Well, you don't, have to, you don't have to make up and grab things out of the air. All you have to do is read the Bible. And you'll find out that a trump was blown for two reasons. To warn or to what? To assemble together. Together. A trump was blown together to, for assembly. And so here that trump is blown in the voice of the archangel. And you get to Revelation chapter number four. And uh, of course, John the revelator heard a voice come up hither. All right, so there's the rapture. Now take your Bible. And we're talking about separated by time. First of all, we had Jesus, the first fruits. We had that wave offering, that sheaf. Uh, being the ones that came out of the grave in verse number 27 and one to follow, being the, the great one to follow, being the church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. This, this will help you now. It'll help you explain things to people. It will. In Revelation chapter 20. Now in Revelation chapter number 19, we know for sure who came back at the end of the tribulation. This is after Mystery Babylon. This is after the financial as well as the political aspect of Babylon. The world system crumbles and the second coming of Christ in glory, verse number 11 and following. And it gets to verse 16. If anyone has a doubt of who this is, read verse 16. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Jesus Christ is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He comes back on a white horse. He don't stop in the air and gather his saints. He comes back in Revelation chapter number 19. The Bible says um, the armies in verse 14, which were in heaven, followed him up on white horses, clothed how? In fine linen, white and clean. We've already found the 24 elders dressed in the same garb in Revelation chapter 4, and they were wearing crowns. The crowns. They weren't wearing the diadem. Only the Lord Jesus wears that. They were wearing what we call Stephanos crowns. They were wearing the crowns. They had been judged at the judgment seat, received their crowns. But here in Revelation chapter number 19, we have, it didn't say armies of angels, 
Angels aren't, they, they can't be saved. It's not indicative of angels to be clothed in white. Although you might see it on TV. Yeah, but it's indicative of church age saints that are washed in the blood of Christ to be clothed in what? White raiment. Am I, am I right? All right, here comes the church back with him, Revelation chapter number 19. And then we get over here to uh, verse chapter 20. Chapter 20, woo, I saw the thrones, verse 4. And they that sat upon them, and uh, judgment was given unto them. Now, we've, um, we've already, we, we've already, uh, we've got the coming of Christ, we've got the battle of Armageddon, and we've got the thousand years. The great white thrones coming up. The great white thrones coming up. But first of all, let's look and see how it, di how it divides itself here in Revelation chapter 20. And I saw thrones, they that sat upon them, and judgment uh, was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right, now, we got a resurrection right here at, the, at Revelation chapter number 19. We got a resurrection, and that is the martyred, tribulational saints, as well as, and I can prove this, as well as the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament is finally, all of the Old Testament saints are finally meeting the promise that God had given them concerning a kingdom. And the Old Testament saints will be at the marriage supper with the bride. They will, according to the book of Revelation, chapter number 19. So Old Testament saints have to be resurrected in order to go into the kingdom to full, for God to fulfill his promise to the nation of Israel. He has to, has to be, no question about it. Has to be. So here we have Jesus Christ, the first fruits. We have those in Matthew chapter number 27. Uh, fulfilling Leviticus 23. And then we have the church and uh, raptured out in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, 1 Corinthians 15. And then we have the um, tribulational saints and the martyr saint, the martyred saints, the martyred tribulational saints and the Old Testament saints. Now, the rapture and the resurrection here in Revelation chapter 20 of the saints it's called the first resurrection. In, in, um, in Daniel chapter 12, we saw two resurrections. In John chapter 5, we saw two resurrections. All right. Part one, if you will, the beginning of that first resurrection and then the finality of that first resurrection is all the Old Testament saints and the martyred tribulational saints, those that died for Christ during that seven years. All right, now, and it says... But the rest, in verse 5 of Revelation 20, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. That's a parenthetical statement going back uh, in verse 5. This is the first resurrection referring to verse number 4. Blessed and holy is he. We know it's the first and second because a thousand years divides it. No, no, there's, we don't have to read in something. It's here. It's right here in front of us. Blessed and holy that he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such a second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. All right, so Satan is loose for this thousand years. We're ruling and reigning with Christ. Everything's over. The thousand years is over. The tribulation's over. The church age is over. All of that's over. And right before the new heaven and the new earth is the second resurrection. If you'll notice in the second resurrection... The Bible said in verse 11 of Revelation 20, And I saw a great white throne, him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead. Death and hell. You have a persuasion around here, two or three persuasions around here that says there's no fiery hell. Jesus Christ, in his word, he doesn't mince words. Why did he say death and hell was delivered up? Because death and hell was delivered up. Amen. It was delivered up. Hell was delivered up. Those that are burning in hell are going to be delivered up to the great white throne judgment in a body 
fit for them to spend eternity in hellfire. They will never burn up. And I'm going to show you 1 Corinthians chapter 15. God gives them a body as he pleases. I'll show you. They'll have a body that can burn. You say, I've never heard of it. Well, who's ever heard of you getting a glorified body living forever? Unless you read it in the Bible. That's our blessed hope. Did you know, get this in your head, man was created to live forever. Forever in one place or another. Now you've got that choice if you want to go to heaven. All right, then the Bible says right here, uh, that death and hell were delivered up and they were judged every man. Verse 14, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we're looking at the order of resurrection. Verse 24, then cometh the end. Then cometh the end. That's the end we just talked about. So that's, that's uh, we, we're looking at uh, the, the, the people saved and lost of all ages, and we're looking at a general, uh, we're not a general, but we're looking at a, a, uh, a, an order, and the Bible uses that word order in their order. That, again, is a military term, means a company or a rank in separate companies. At separate times, these resurrections take place. Then cometh the end, and verse 24, when it says, shall have delivered, past tense. Last thing to happen before the new heaven and the new earth is that last resurrection. Now, the Bible knows no such thing as a general resurrection. No such thing at all. Um, I went through 1 Corinthians 15 one time since I've been here, but I never did get to um, verse 26 and following. That's some difficult reading. Has anybody ever read that? Did you read it the first time and get a hold of it? We're going to talk about it. But I cannot do it. I, I, I can't do the Bible justly in, in the time that I have left. But we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about baptizing for the dead. We're going to talk about um, uh, putting all things under his feet. Uh, the, verse 27 is a doozy now. Uh, verse 28. When all things... Uh, shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Verse 29. We're going to talk about that, but I can't do it, I can't do it uh, justice tonight in the time that I have left. So here's a good place to stop. After the order of the resurrections, the three resurrections has taken place, everything's put under uh, put under his feet and then Christ is going to deliver this back up. Okay, we're going to talk about that and then we're going to look at the different kinds of bodies that are given right here according to the 1 Corinthians 15. This is a rich chapter. It's one of the richest chapters on resurrections and truths about resurrections and uh, glorified bodies and bodies that God gives fit for burning in hell and everything else. So study it out. We'll talk about it again Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Because I want to get it in before um, Easter if I can. All right.